Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. I uh, am Saumya Swaminathan, and I'm the chief scientist of the WHO. And I should um, perhaps give you a little bit of introduction on the WHO's new transformation, um, which the DG just carried out a few months ago. And within that, one of the things that happened was the creation of a science division. And I am, um, I'm the, was appointed as, a, as the first chief scientist of WHO, which is a little bit surprising, considering the fact that WHO is a science-based, evidence-based, normative organization. We've been around for 70 years, but it's good that we finally have the office of the chief scientist. Um, this division is, has been set up to harness the power of, of science and technology and innovation and harness it in a way that will benefit the health of the world's population uh, in a more deliberate and systematic way than we have been doing in the past. We must also move faster and with more foresight because obviously technology is, is changing so rapidly. So we're setting up a foresight function which is going to look at emerging technologies and what the implications of those technologies could be for public health. So, so really what are the benefits that we could harness from that, but also on the other side, what the potential risks could be, uh, if any, and how those risks could be anticipated or managed. Um, and also for the public really to be educated and engaged in a discussion on, on, on these new technologies. The second major function of this division will be to ensure the, the technical excellence, the relevance, and the efficiency of our core technical functions. So that's all the norms and standards um, that we produce, and we're looking at really standardizing across the house and using the latest methods uh, in development of those norms and standards and guidelines. Now, within the science division, there is a department of digital health, and you'll hear from uh, Bernardo a little bit more about this later. But it was created because we realized that everything is going to be digital very soon. And therefore, the, in fact, the health area is probably one that's been left behind a little bit uh, compared to other things like transport, perhaps infrastructure, financial services, where digital has really made a lot of inroads. Uh, we still need to, to see that happening on a large scale in health. So there are many opportunities in, in, in front of us and, and, and also many policy decisions that will need to be made in order to maximize the use of, of these digital tools and technologies to advancing health. Because very often you do see, and when we discuss with member states, they tell us that they, they are confused. They don't know what technologies to invest in. They often invest in something just to find that the different systems are not interoperable, they're not talking to each other, and so they end up with fragmented um, digital systems within their own infrastructure where they still don't then uh, have a holistic uh, database. So one of the things that WHO is being tasked to do by our member states is to advise them on what kind of investments they should make in digital health and where. Based on, based on a systematic study and collection of evidence. And there is now a lot of international groups, global groups, including a, something called a Global Digital Health Partnership of about 26 countries that's been in operation for about two years. And they've set up working groups to look at things like interoperability, cybersecurity, uh, the clinical evidence base for the use of some of these um, technology. So there is a lot of interest, um, and they look to WHO really to, to set some of the, the standards. So we're now in the process of developing a digital health strategy that will go to member states next year at the World Health Assembly. So exactly a year from now, the strategy has been up on our uh, website for public comments, and I'm sure that uh, some of you have seen it or may have even commented. We got a large number of comments on the process of revising it now. We do want to make full use of innovations, uh, innovations and in technologies, but also innovations in other health products, devices, drugs, vaccines, 
uh, and uh, uh, social interventions. And so we've set up an innovation hub, which is really going to be like the front door for innovations that people can, can talk to WHO and partner with us. Our function, again, is to, is to look at the evidence base around these innovations and make recommendations based on whether there's enough evidence of uh, benefit compared to harms. That's how we do our, all our guidelines. And if there isn't enough evidence, then we would say that and encourage people to actually do more research and more data gathering. And then we want to see those innovations that are really have a lot of potential to see them scaled up quite rapidly. We see many, many examples now of potentially wonderful solutions being tried and tested in small settings, um, something that's often called pilotitis. There are lots of pilots that are done, but very difficult to get um, scale up happening. And so that's where we need also our implementing partners. And uh, what happens with health products is once WHO says that these are effective, they, we put them on the list of essential medicines or, or devices or, or diagnostics. Then the large funding agencies globally, uh, the multilaterals as well as countries themselves, then start purchasing those products because they know there's a quality assurance stamp. So, so we're thinking about how do we do this in the field of artificial intelligence and uh, as Dr. Lee has just said, we, we have a focus group, the AI for Health focus group that's now, uh, and, and Thomas is, is chairing that focus group about eight or, eight or nine months old now, just looking at the landscape of what's out there and what, what should we be working on. Obviously, there's a lot of potential to harness AI for health. There's no doubt about that. All of you are experts in this field. The question is, I think, what problem are you trying to solve? We have to we have to first articulate the problem and then bring the technology to solve the problem. So is it a problem of, of not having enough doctors or healthcare workers in remote rural settings, say in Africa or in Asia? Are we trying to use technology to, in some ways, make up or replace the, the lack of adequate human resources, let's say for diagnosis um, or for providing advice on treatment protocols. Um, so is that the use case scenario? Um, is it to automate the use of uh, machine learning algorithms for reading of images, CT scans or x-rays, for example, so that you can free up radiologists who are very rare in many countries, they're not enough, so that they could then focus on the more difficult um, questions? Um, or are there other case uses in, in predicting disease outbreaks and epidemics, for example, by, by analyzing large data, or analyzing data from multiple sectors, including um, weather and, uh, and air and land and water data, for example, uh, vector densities to predict outbreaks of vector-borne diseases. So there, there are a number of things you could, you could think about. And then, of course, there's the huge growing market of direct-to-consumer products, the, the hundreds of app apps that are now available that people can download and use to do all kinds of things. Um, and there's a risk in that as well, because if something has not been evaluated and people start using it for self-diagnosis and self-treatment, it might end up actually doing more harm than, than good. And so there, there needs to be some kind of regulation some kind of framework, a governance framework, and that's something that we're thinking that the WHO needs to take a lead on, where of course we will work with all the partners, regulatory agencies, like the FDA and the European agencies, but also our other UN partners um, as, we, as we go forward. But this would be something of, of high priority to us. The other aspects that we're, I think, seeing with these technologies is, is on the ethical side, uh, because very often we're talking about the use of data. And when you talk about the use of, of human data, then of course the question is who owns that data? And there's no doubt that if it's data that's coming from you, then, then as an individual, then you have full rights on that data. But you might want to share that data for the greater public good. And so I think a few countries have been very progressive in that they've had these discussions with their citizens and have been able to come 
to very good understanding on people having the rights to their own data and they can protect that if they like, you know, if they want to keep something confidential or, or private. But to a large extent, believing that health data is a public good, be also willing to share it um, for the greater good so with governments. Um, in, and there's a certain amount of trust, obviously, that, that's involved here. If they share it with governments, if they share it with WHO, they expect that there will be safeguards and that it will not you know, be, be put to commercial use without their consent or, or be used to discriminate in any way, but would be used to feed into, into things which would improve you know, health of the population at large. But this involves a wider discussion, and so we do want to also engage in discussions with the public, uh, with philosophers and ethicists and social scientists about the implications of some of these new technologies, and, and AI is, is definitely one of those um, that we're doing. We, we're doing it for, for other areas like gene editing, for example, where you know, there, there's always very polarized debate on whether human gene, embryonic gene editing should be allowed uh, at all or not. And, and, and there are very strong views on this. So we now have a group of international, globally recognized uh, experts, not just scientists, but ethicists as well, who are debating this issue and coming up with some global governance principles. So so as I mentioned, uh, you know, there could be many, 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 many applications. And we want to do whatever is good for the greater good. We have now in our five-year plan, which is very well aligned with the SDGs, the triple billion goals um, that WHO articulated last year. And the triple billion goals are to get one billion more people on universal health coverage, one billion more people better protected from health emergencies, and one billion more people living healthier lives. So it's not just a question of protecting from disease or treating disease, but really about well-being. Well and how do you keep, people are going to live longer, but they also need to be able to live healthy, um, especially towards the, uh, the latter part of, of their lives. The experiences in some countries could be very useful for, for others. As I mentioned, some countries have been quite progressive in dealing with the issues of, uh, of digital health and, and AI. Uh, partnerships and collaborations are going to be critical also. Um, and, and we need to consider what solutions to bring to countries which are at various stages of income and development. So the same solution that applies in a high-income country may not be relevant at all for a low-income country and vice versa. So I think the dialogue needs to happen with the end users, with the ministries of health, with the care providers in different settings and with the population to, to know what, uh, what they would like. So we're going to be um, having many more of these conversations with, with all of you and especially with our partner, the ITU. We've been discussing where the focus group should really areas should be looking at and I think you'll hear more from Thomas and some of the other speakers on today's panel and we look forward to your uh, inputs and guidance and, and ideas as we take this work forward together. Thank you very much. Thank you.